So I always joke with my text that after I got my PhD, I was a resident and imaging resident in, in physics. And I kind of got another PhD in learning clinical workflow from my CT techs. So I'm not a CT technologist, but I work very, very closely with them. I would not be here uh, uh, on any stage without all the experience and knowledge I gain, gained from them and continue uh, to learn from them. So we're very close in the team, the techs and I at my institution. Here's my conflicts again. Um, we do have a bunch of research with different CT vendors, including Canon and GE Healthcare. Um, I'm going to talk about some techniques that vendors make, uh, but nothing is, is going to be like super vendor specific. We'll just be talking in, in generalities. So I, I tried to think about this like an interesting way to, to think about, you know, what, the role of a technologist and why their job is so difficult. And I think they're constantly being told, do more faster, right? So CT demands the throughput of an assembly line. But at the same time, we're giving you multiple page documents to define what we want you to do to each patient. So you want assembly line throughput with the attention and detail of a craftsman's eye. I don't know, I just came up with this quote. It probably could be re reworded better, but it's a hard job to be a technologist, to do every desire the radiologist has and to be tuning what you're doing on a really uh, to pa patient to patient. It's not, not, not an easy task. All right, so when we think about how many different widgets or something you know you need to make on this assembly line, there are a lot of them, hundreds of protocols. It's one of the CE questions. Hundred, I think it's hundred to five hundred is the answer of, of of different protocols that you're gonna see at any kind of large like academic or just large hospital center that has a cancer clinic and does um, uh, um, tr transplant surgeries and, and those kinds of things. So we've got entire books in radiology, you know, just to talk about all the different types of procedures we can do. Here's an example. This is from a large healthcare system that uh, I was working with. This was just all the different names for their routine abdomen pelvis protocols across their scanner fleet. Um, a, they, you know, they don't have uh, uniformity there, uh, but you can imagine, you know, um, many total protocols they had in the system if this was just their routine abdomen pelvis. All right, so I wanted to talk about concrete strategies. And I think too often uh, the role of the technologist gets underplayed in the role for, for dose reduction. And people want to buy their way out of this. They want the easy button. They want to say, hey, forget trying to do change management with the techs. We're just going to spend an extra 100 grand in the scanner and get this sweet bell and whistle option that's going to denoise images or do something fancy and reduce dose. And that takes, that, that doesn't always, you know, that's not always a good payoff. But I'm going to talk in this talk about some things that are, I call kind of CT practice culture and that can achieve much bigger gains in patient dose reduction, require uh, technologists and radiologists working together collaboratively to achieve those goals. So that's the kind of way I think about this. Easy street doesn't really work. The harder street of practice culture changes is going to lead to bigger dose reduction. So here's an example, right? You can buy some iterative denoising option, maybe save maybe 15% on those um, with all the associated problems that that might cause, or plastic looking images, et cetera. You know, or maybe your clinic is doing a lot of repeat scanning. So the timing on a PE uh, exam is not adequate and you're constantly, you know, 10 or 20% of all your PEs get repeated. So you're double dosing all those patients, right? So I think like the vendor really wants to push their product at RSNA every year by saying, we've got this new bell and whistle thing that saves you dose, right? Um, that's what they want. You know, you're told that you need to pay more money for those scanners. Um, but unfortunately, the kinds of things you need to do to save like real big amounts of dose, that might also be challenging um, because no one really wants to change the way that they practice uh, CT. They don't want to change your, your job's workflow. So we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. So I like to start about when we talk about dose reduction to kind of frame in our minds, like, what kind of dose reductions um, that, we're, that, we're, that we're looking at that come from strictly technology. So this is a paper looking at effective dose reductions over time from various different types of technology implementations. So I kind of think of these in two groups, like one is acquisition, things you can do, and one's reconstruction. So, um, you know, here's kind of like Tim Stick's assessment of like the, if any of these have legs, right? Most of the things technology-wise, any CT scanner you buy today is already going to have um, a four centimeter or more AEC is pretty standard. You know, they have an optimized source spectra. They're going to do Z-axis collimation. Like, it's hard to find one that doesn't have that. Um, iterative recon, that's pretty much almost universally um, disliked by RADS when it's used too heavy. So it's its ability to, like, really let you crank the doses down qu 
questionable. I think when this came out, that was around the same time when people just realized, oh, maybe I don't need 30 milligray for an average size routine uh, abdominal patient. So they turned it down. Concurrently, though, they had iterative denoising on and then like iterative denoising got a lot of the credit for that. You know, historically, if you look back, I think um, that's how I see that. Um, this interior tomography is not really clinical reality. We just forget about that. And then photon counting. I think there is real promise here uh, for some dose reductions, especially on small things with high contrast, right? Like inner ear imaging, uh, bone imaging, lung imaging. I think the current scanner doesn't have like an FDA claim like for dose reduction, but like undoubtedly for those kinds of high contrast image tasks, it's going to way blow out of the water an EID scanner because it just has that higher um, spatial resolution limit. For the dual energy efficiency for like iodine maps and whatnot, that's a little questionable for the the one scanner that's FDA cleared right now. But I'm sure we're going to see improvements from all the from that vendor and all the vendors in that space uh, over time. Okay, so um, we'll go back to my like road diverging here. So again, we went we can't really technology our way out by but the vendors want to do that by selling something new. Um, and the hard way to do this, um, we really haven't seen a lot of vendor technology here helping us change our practice culture management. I, I, I'm slow to say like dose monitoring solution is, is really changing practice culture. Uh, monitoring dose is like a speedometer, right? It tells you like how you're doing. You can, you can use it as a launch pad for an optimization effort, but it's not being, it's not exactly like out of the box, just knowing your dose. It's not clear exactly like how to optimize one's practice. Um, we'll talk more kind of along these lines. So here's some actual information I have from thus far in the talk, right? We want to be wary of dose reduction claims tied to, tied to vendor solutions. You know, the vendors we know they have to come out with those new every year. Um, and like how much work does your team need to do to realize that dose reduction, right? Like if you buy that solution, but then you need to spend a lot of time like doing maybe what Dr. Siebert just said, iterating down your dose. I mean, there's like a lot of effort involved with that. And you just have to realize that it's not just like a turnkey type of a thing, right? What if we applied that to some other kind of effort in our clinic? Maybe there's a bigger payoff there. So let's just take a look at one of the more popular ones is iterative reconstruction, right? Here's what I mean about like the plastic nature, right? Um, if you push these things too high, the images fundamentally change their appearance. The noise goes down, but the texture changes. And radiologists uh, listening now, you know, um, you might appreciate like some of my rads, they call this like a pseudo lesion appearance, right? Some of these clusters of noise now look suspiciously like lesions. And that can be very frustrating for radiologists to see all these lesions all of a sudden popping out where there were none uh, previously. Here's just another example. Pretty ex like these are, these are extreme examples, right? Of like taking it, to 100% or level five or whatever your vendor, um, however they let you control that strength. And we know uh, when we push it too hard that we're gonna have some uh, major issues, right? So like, here's a study, there's there's a few studies out there that have the study design to show this. I'm just highlighting uh, one of them, but they basically, there was known uh, lesions that are like a regular dose scan, then they lowered the dose and some of those lesions disappeared with the, uh, when you and they, they were not recoverable when you tried to apply the types of iterative reconstruction that would have brought the noise level back to the original dose level. In other words, uh, you can maintain noise, but the clinically important stuff in the image can be uh, obliterated. So you don't really have um, no sense in dose reduction if you're losing diagnostic utility of the images, right? So the, some of these gains we saw in some of these early papers with these huge CNR changes, not really so, so much clinically feasible. I think more realistic is just, uh, you know, bringing the dose down by a smaller amount, like 25% um, reduction and applying like a mid-level amount of iterative reconstruction. Here I'm showing a GE Acer, but, you know, this works for all the different vendors have offerings like this that you can use to achieve a little bit of better image quality um, at, at a little bit lower dose. So we're not going to... Um, talk more about iterative. Don't worry. Now I want to try to get into some like actual concrete things because that's what I promised that a technologist can do like at scan time or in meetings, you know, before when you're just working on quality projects. There's a lot though of technology-based options we have to wade through when we're buying a scanner. And a lot of these things, uh, honestly, in my opinion, I think have less impact on dose than the practice culture or like decision-making things that a technologist can do at scan time. So let's, let's talk about some of those. So We'll first start with cardiac options, right? If you're doing cardiac, I think it's pretty clear that there's real dose reductions that can be had from technology. 
Uh, and here I'm referring to the difference we would have between a prospective gating and a retrospective gating. And a technologist at scan time, depending on the technology, really is empowered, especially if the case is not monitored by a physician, to make important decisions on how they're going to gate a patient, right? Technologists might, the patient comes down, maybe the, the cardiac nurse, you know, they tried their best with beta blockers and all that stuff, and it's just still kind of high heart rate. So they might have to make the call, like, are we going to use the retrospective protocol then, or can we still try to get away with prospective? If they know, maybe they have more power. It's like an elephant gun, if you will, type protocol. If they do more dose by doing a retrospective protocol and they get less complaints from radiologists, you know, that's a call that that, that, that individual technologist kind of has, like maybe they might want to be um, using more retrospective protocol to kind of more ensure they have like that elephant gun like protocol. So anyway, I'm not um, not saying that everyone does that, but that's a real thing that could be present in one's clinic. So we just really have to be aware that we're prop we need to be properly triaging patients into the proper dose optimized protocol. So here's kind of a view of what these two different protocols look like. We've got a prospective protocol, right, which is only turning the x-ray beam on during the part of the um, heart's uh, cycle where we think it's going to be uh, the less amount of motion contaminated data versus a retrospective protocol, which is basically just blasting away um, all the time, uh, collecting a lot of data. So here I'm just showing one vendor's um, way that they automatically can pick this for a technologist. So I think this is really a great way. Concrete strategies, the technologists can make sure they understand the dose trade-offs with various cardiac protocols. And if they have an advanced scanner with a GUI like I'm showing here, that they understand how this works so that it can work right at scan time. Basically, what this what this is is a lot of numbers in this table, but it the scanner looks at the variability in the heart uh, rate, looks for irregular beats, looks for the overall heart rate, and it uh, a priori picks before the patient uh, scan what kind of acquisition is most likely to get a motion uh, free scan of that patient. So. Um, my comments here, that this can be a great way to not have to have technician make a, a, te a technologist make a decision at scan time because the scanner can do a lot of this for you. Um, comment here is you just got to be careful like how the vendor implements this. When we had this at our institution, we kind of found the vendor was really focused on the dose reduction and we had a lot of edge cases where we would have liked to have another 10% or something of the RR imaged so that we could still make sure if there was a more variation than the scanner had seen previously in the ECG recording, that we'd still get away with a, with a good um, motion-free uh, scan. So we, we did modify this a little bit, our institution, but this has been working really fabulous for us. And the scanner where we have this smart algorithm like this, we don't have to have technicians make, or technologists uh, make scan time decisions on like one protocol versus another. We have to know though. So now when we put our like QA uh, type hat or QC type hat on and we're looking back at historic dose data, when you've got a system like this, you're going to have a lot of variation in your doses that have nothing to do with patient size that are actually tied to the patient's heart rate, which, um, you know, can be new to some folks who aren't, who aren't used to this, right? These scanners are going to be controlling how much dose they deliver based on heart rate and heart rate variability. So we've got to know this. We've got to understand this, right? If you've got a patient, they could be a really small patient. They come in, the scanner detects a lot of irregular like PVCs or whatever. It might know, okay, I'm going to scan this heart three times just because the heart rate's crazy and there's a lot of weird stuff going on. And that might look like some weird dose liar, outlier, but that's perfectly um, fine. That's what you wanted because we really needed that coronary CTA performed and that patient was throwing a lot of PVCs and the scanner took that into account and just acquired three scans which is a good thing uh, probably for that patient. So instead of having to recontrast bolus them and then rescan them anyway, 10 minutes later, as we brought in you know, uh, the nurse and tried to maybe give them more meds or calm them down or whatever, we could avoid all of that. So just to understand this more about the range of different ways a modern cardiac CT scanner can adapt, I'm just kind of flash through a few different slides of like what today's like premium type of a CT scanner can do just to kind of we're not going to get into all the vendor nuances here because there's many more than I'll ever understand. But like, say, for example, your scanner could opt into a pure retrospective mode with no MA modulation, where it just has a certain MA level. It just scans data in a slow, say, helical or spiral acquisition. It could do that same thing, but try to do a little bit of prospective flavor in there and modulate the MA values up over certain parts of the EKG cycle. 
it could do um, that same thing, but modulate right down to zero where it didn't have, um, where, 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 where it didn't want to acquire data. It could do something like this, where there's a certain R to R range that it gives a lot of dose and then a wider one just for safety, where you could still get an image, but there'd just be a little bit more noise in that image. Um, you could have two different R to R phases uh, in within one um, beat to beat cycle. You could have something that looks like this again with just a one single acquisition, but with one high MA zone and one lower MA zone, um, et cetera. So like all of those things, a team that's doing quality assurance review just needs to be aware of, right? This one in particular could be troublesome if the RADs are complaining, the images are lower MA and they don't understand that maybe the best beat for motion was here, but they did have that high MA data set in, in, in the stack, but they just, you know, it weren't presented that one by the scanner because it, it maybe the scanner thought it had more motion. Anyway, understanding all these things at scan time by a technologist and, um, it is really important. So um, advanced premium MDCT scanner will come with uh, these tools and to help you pick the retro versus prospective dose and ultra acquisition for patient heart rate and heart rate stability. Yeah, and this needs the this means the dose will not be a function of the patient size and the patient heart rate and stability, therefore. All right, so hopefully that's uh, that's that's pretty clear. Um, and again, this is a concrete strategy for technologists because on some scanners, right, it is up to the technologist to move between these modes, right? If you're on like a dual source, maybe you could switch between doing like that triple type flash type acquisition and a slower uh, retrospective gated one, same thing on whether it's a single score scanner, that's a decision that the technologist is gonna need to make. I'll move on now to fluoroscopy. This is not done at like every single center in the country, but there are really important things that a technologist, if they understand, can do to reduce um, the patient dose. So. First off is if you're a technologist and you're doing interventional CT and you're using MA values and doses that seem to be the same for diagnostic, I think you you know that's that's not that's not okay, okay, right? If if um, your rads are walking in and out of the room and every time they want to check on their needle or device progression, they're using a diagnostic protocol, that just doesn't uh, make sense. The imaging task that the radiologist is doing in most all of these cases is crazy high contrast, right? They're they're pushing through a piece of metal through soft tissue, all right. If all if there is some critical structure that they know they might be getting close to, you know, you might need to get a little bit better image quality. But for the most part, where you should be talking about like milligray or sub milligray dose levels being used in this case, but there are a lot of places, a lot of places that still will not do in room CT fluoro. Uh, they'll walk out of the room and they'll just do another diagnostic CT volume. It's wrong in a few ways. One, the dose level is way too high and the images are way better than needed. And two, if they're using a diagnostic protocol and not a true interventional mode, they're going to irradiate a big chunk of the patient they don't need to, right? Because usual spiral or helical mode doesn't let you just acquire like one, uh, uh, like a few millimeters of tissue like a true interventional mode would let you do. So as a technologist, um, I'm telling you, if your rats disagree, like you can have them come talk to me. Uh, I'd be happy to go to battle for you here. Um, th this is a, a big no-no. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions in CT fluoroscopy in general, and that a lot of physicians think they're going to be getting way more X-ray dose from a CT scanner than say they would if they were doing an interventional procedure on a C-arm. Uh, but all the same fundamental things we know from CRM fluoroscopy are going to work in the CT suite, right? If we um, have a bigger dose rate, the physician scatter is going to go up, right? So don't be using diagnostic dose levels here. You should be using like 10 MA or maybe up to 60 MA is typical at our institution at like a half second rotation time. So these are images are going to look pretty bad. They're going to be pretty noisy. Uh, increases in collimated beam area, right? So if your physicians are using some sort of like four centimeter or really big beam collimation to progress a needle through, they really shouldn't. They really shouldn't be doing that, right? We should have gantry tilt on, trying to get in the plane of the needle. Um, our physicians will only go that really big beam collimation if they're kind of quote lost inside the patient. Then they might take a bigger collimation, but for most of that needle guidance work, it's a very narrow, just like seven and a half around millimeter beam. Um, and then the scatter is always higher where the x-rays enter the patient. This is true for C-arms and computed tomography, right? So you want to be on the so-called, um, you, you, sorry, you don't want to be on the, the tube side. At the tube side, 
um, that's where the most scattered radiation is coming off. Um, so we did a little survey uh, use of different research papers and compared the actual doses in C-arm and in CT. And basically what we found was that for typical procedures in both, physicians are going to get like almost 10 times lower dose on CT than C-arm. So if you're at a shop where you might be as a technologist um, thinking like, why are my rads walking in and out of the room? You know, why is these patient doses at diagnostic levels and not an interventional? And the rats say, well, because I don't want to get all that scatter radiation dose. That's kind of a, um, not kind of, it is a misconception in our field that they're going to get these really high dose levels. They're, they're going to get a lot less than they would in a CRM based interventional procedure. Obviously, they should wear lead still, um, wear, you know, gla glasses, thyroid shield, et cetera, but it's going to be much lower than in a um, CRM type procedure. So here's some examples of this kind of to bring it home. Um, this is just a real email that I had with a site that was trying to do this image quality at the top here for like needle. Uh, this was a bone biopsy, you know, to push the needle through. Like they don't need this level image quality to do what's going on down here, right? We're just doing a bone biopsy. These images suffice. Uh, you don't need this really high level of dose, but that's a huge difference in dose, right? 68 to like one milligray. Now, granted, this is like over an extremity, so the effective dose isn't that big, but this was at the patient's side. So like the rest of that patient's gonna be getting that dose level. And the same concept here of, you don't need this level of image quality to push a needle through. It's gonna hold in the lung, it's gonna hold in the liver, uh, et cetera, the kidney. All right, so my uh, this is a concrete thing here is, you know, don't use diagnostic dose level for interventional. The next one, a concrete thing that you can do is looking at your dual energy CT protocols. If you're a dual energy shop today, one of the concrete things you, you can do is if your RADs are using the virtual non-enhanced images um, today, that you can be skipping that non-contrast phase. Now, this is obviously not something a technologist or a physicist even is going to decide on in, in an institution, but it is a concrete solution that a technologist is going to be involved with. Because if you're doing the same type of orderable or protocol on three different scanners, and one of them is a dual energy scanner, and your RADs are agreeing that the virtual non-contrast or virtual unenhanced images can suffice from that scanner, it's up to the technologist you know, to know that that protocol is built to not do that phase or just to know that they can skip that phase and save the patient that amount of dose. This is, there's plenty of papers on this. This is just one example of comparing the true non-contrast with the virtual non-contrast. There's pros and cons. It's not perfect, but for a lot of indications, it can suffice to replace that true non-contrast and you can save your dose. Uh, save the patient some dose there. All right, the next one is extended field of view. All right, this one might not be one that is easily understood right away, so I just want to uh, we'll, we'll explain a little bit. So a typical patient, I think this is a CT scan of me, I think, um, you know, you, 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 get a, you get a scan, they're not, they're not pushing the limits of the field of view, okay? Um, and your reconstruction window is fine, uh, and, and you, can, you can scan that patient and without, um, without any truncation problems. But you are going to have some larger patients, like a whiteout here in the scout, I call it. We don't, unfortunately, the patient's so large, you don't see any of the surrounding air. It's just all like white. You know. Uh, anyway, those types of patients, your technologists better know, and I think this is a concrete strategy here, how to image them properly. So we're not just imaging them again and again and again, repeating the images with ever more increasing dose. So right away, when you see a patient that's filling up the scout like this, the technologists should know what to do. Either they're going to shift that patient all the way to one side and then image, and then all the way to the other. And that can mitigate this horrible like truncation artifact, mixing that up. Or the concrete strategy is a priori, the patient looks at the BM, or the technologist looks at the patient's BMI and weight, and then it's going to schedule them on a scanner with a wide field of view option so that they don't have all those truncation um, artifacts. And sorry, I'm just checking the uh, um, questions here to see if there's anything I should address quick, uh, but I think we'll just keep going because I can't read that much and multitask. So um, let's go forward. All right. So... The next thing I want to talk about is scanning these unindicated phases. Uh, Dr. Siebert uh, got into this a little bit, um, actually a lot by showing us how his shop does those protocol guides. So I'm going to talk about it from a, a different perspective and show that we arrived at the a similar solution um, as UC Davis, as most would about uh, protocol indication guides. But anyway, we did a study, uh, or not me, but my institution did a study before I, I got there, uh, looking at unindicated phases in the in the um, abdomen and how much extra radiation dose they give. So they actually found 
that for the patients that were referred to us from outlying centers, that about half of them received phases that weren't supported by ACR criteria, and that resulted in like a mean effective excess dose, excuse me, of like 17 uh, millisieverts. So definitely not a trivial thing. Um, so how do you combat something like this where, right, the indication says, hey, you don't need the three phases, but people do it anyway? Well, you just got to give people the right direction, right? Um, you know, technologist doesn't want to get in trouble for not giving the radiologist everything that's needed. And if they don't have clear guidance on what to do, it's, of course, the natural solution would be I'll scan all the phases I can so that I can make sure I get the radiologist the images they need, right? So, but if you take a little bit of time and build something like Tony showed or like I'm showing here where you're linking indications with specific protocols and those protocols have the number of phases with the right contrast delays set up, you can easily, easily, easily reduce dose. And this is a super concrete thing that a technologist can really own. That is making sure everyone's on the same page of their cohort of technologists with the people that are ordering these things or protocoling them, the radiologists, so that they know when, when they get an order for, you know, HCC liver, exactly how many phases are going to be there or trauma abdomen pelvis, they know there better be a special doctor note maybe for that delayed um, phase to look for a slow leak or something only for these types of traumas, you know, et cetera. We just have to decide on that beforehand. That's a concrete strategy of technologists. If you're listening, you can own that. And I think run that. And then you've got to make sure your team knows that and maybe it's programmed into the scanner. Or there's notes uh, for that somewhere. So here's just an example. We went into a shop down at Auctionary, the, the UW team, the uh, a vendor uh, collaboration partner. And I used some of their dose data to look at, okay, when the orderable was routine abdomen pelvis, like how often were you guys using more than one phase? And it was kind of like half the time they were using two or more series uh, to do that, and their dose value was around 925 uh, milligray for the for the DLP there. Um, here I'm using DLP uh, because it's it's like the dose, but then how long you know they scan? They scan two times, so it's like double the length, kind of if you will. So we came in and we gave them this booklet that you can see here. You can find this online on our website. It's it's open source access, etc. But the, after we trained their staff in how to do that kind of protocol mapping, their medium DLP basically went down almost by two, and you can see much more frequently one single phase was imaged. Now, this has a number of good things, like the tube is being used less. That's good financially. The uh, time in the scan room goes down. The dose to the patient, of course, goes down. The number of images the radiologists get goes down. And it's all just as simple as what Tony and I are showing you here, owning a document like this that does this kind of protocoling. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about a concrete strategy is when we can get away with scanning the same body region to fulfill uh, um, multiple orders, right? So we want to avoid having like, if you get an order for a sinus and a routine head, something, and they're both like non-contrast scanning in my shop, we would not scan those as two separate things because we can retro reconstruct one, you know, from the other. Now, you can get into a lot of trouble here and there might be a lot of different preferences from radiology or radiologists on like how this is supposed to be done. So again, I think this is something a technologist can really own strategy for, for you to have a dose reduction ability at your institution. So you've got to um, sit down and understand like what the dose reduction potential is, is here and where commonly multiple orders come that you can take advantage of the so for, for example, if I had the order for routine head, sinus and facial bones, we don't want to do a, a head, sinus, and facial bone. We could just scan the routine head and then do reformats for the other ones. So like here's that, that we can do that at my institution because we give the same uh, master protocol or the same dose level for all three. And the head, fortunately, has the scan coverage that includes those other two things. Now, this is going to be site specific. That's why I think it's a concrete thing that it's not like a plug and play. Technologists sit down and figure this out with radiologists and then they have to implement this so that everyone's on the same page, but you can have real big dose reductions, right? There's no bigger dose reduction than just not doing the scan and actually still getting all the same diagnostic information, right? That's what we're talking about here. So some words of caution, right? Lots of sites, they like to rescan the same anatomy multiple times because of contrast needs. So like, don't try to do something where it's like, oh, I'm going to combine these two things, but the rads really needed the first one non-con and they really wanted the first one with contrast. So if you try to combine them both, like you get in trouble, right? You got to understand that. Um, yeah, so make sure the contrast dynamics are appropriate. The second one is 
okay, you get a lot of trouble from technologists, especially if like me, a physicist goes in and thinks I know, you know, better than I, than I know. Um, they might have a lot of reformats, specially made and pre-built. Okay. So if you're asking a site to retro recon another orderable from an existing scan, ah, that might make a lot of extra work for the technologists, right? They're not going to be happy with you. They maybe they're like, okay, fine, I saved some dose, but now I got to spend five minutes programming in all these reformats, right? So you got to appreciate that. You got to understand that it's all change management, right? You got to get buy in and then, okay, we want to do this. So we're going to have to build some reconstructions, pre build them, and just allow the technologist to just turn them on maybe when needed so we don't have to rely on them to manually set all those up that's a way i would fix that but we just got to appreciate that some of the stuff isn't just like trivial for the technologist at scan time okay uh and then lastly like if there's going to be a rules for doing all of this like you better write it down right we can't just have some memo go out like oh like can you remember last year the head and the sinus can be combined but you can't do that with like cta head and remember no we got to have very clean instructions. So here, um, here's a, the documentation like we have at our institution for the various places in the body where we can do this and how we bill for it, um, et cetera. There's a lot. You, you can open it. I, I said the word billing and I don't want to get in, into it anymore about how you might, how this might affect billing. That's a discussion you're going to have to have with your billing and, and coding folks. But uh, from a dose perspective, um, it definitely is potential here to save some dose. All right, the next one I want to talk about uh, is repeat scanning, right? So um, again, this is one of those other things where like you want dose reduction. Like if you're doing repeat scanning that um, because the first scan, there was some issue with contrast dynamics or patient motion, and um, then you have to repeat that scan. You're just literally like throwing dose away in like basically 100%, multiples of like 100%, right? So we got we to gotta, we gotta do something about that. So the first thing I think you need to do is like actually be, you know, monitoring those repeat rates. All right. So like by repeat, I mean something like this, right? You've got, this is an axial, uh, it's kind of like where we've got some motion. You can see all these horrible artifacts. Like that image is not clinically going to be clinically useful here uh, for most things. Uh, maybe just to rule out some sort of big infection or something, but you know, pretty much that image is garbage. We got We got to repeat that, deliver another contrast of, uh, if, if it wasn't with contrast, another bolus of contrast and a radiation dose. Uh, here's just an example. This is a, probably the most common, if I had to guess, across all sites in the world. You know, issues with contrast timing for like a pulmonary embolism exam. For a bolus on the left, you can see how bright the SVC is. The pulmonary artery is not that bright. On the right, it got a little better, uh, good enough now that it's diagnostic on the right. Uh, but that was a repeat scan on the right. So it's no surprise, like here's a study we did where you got your normal exams with no repeats and then you compare the total dose that patients got when there were repeats, it goes up, right? This is um, as expected, almost by definition. Kind of interesting that we found it went up by more than double. Uh, and we found that was because there seemed to be a higher likelihood for our larger patients to have repeat exams. I think probably due to some of these issues with contrast dilution and other things, but um, uh, that was something interesting to note there. Yeah, so we can track this by all sorts of different things, by like what tech's doing it on what scanner and what particular phases um, are having problems, right? Like most of us probably have technologists that are most comfortable in one piece of equipment than another piece and most comfortable with one type of protocol than another kind of protocol. So you can really deep dive into a lot of this and understand exactly where your problematic um, issues are occurring. All right, so... Uh, yeah, this is just some of our work on this where we demonstrated um, that you could have sites with really low repeats on the same protocol and other sites for the same indication and protocol that are high. What is the scream? It screams that there is solvable problem, right? Because it's the same scanner, same protocol, same patient population, big changes in repeat rate. That means the local staff who are running it, um, you know, it's not like, I guess it's their fault, but it's an opportunity to uh, try to reduce and train that. Rebecca, I see you join. We, I, we have five minutes, right? Or, uh, you have time. Absolutely. You have another five minutes. I I, okay. I, I wanted to ask you a question when you're done. So All I, right. You, you know, know what, then? I think I think that was my like almost last slide. So um, I think we're good. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that this is you not some you don't need a fancy solution for this. OK, our lab is uh, there's a company that we, we have a patent on this, whatever. But like you don't need any fancy solution here. Literally, um, you can just have an Excel spreadsheet that if a technologist does this, they can enter it in. You can track frequency of this by technologist. I, I, I help uh, some of the sites we um, that I consult for track it like this, and this can still yield really valuable information here. So 
yeah, like without a fancy informatic solution, we can do that. And the automated solutions, yeah, there are some out there now that you can utilize. So I like this kind of plot. This is kind of how I think about it. And that is if you want a big um, bang for your buck, um, you might not need to actually like spend a lot of money. It's a lot of these things I talked about, big dose savings. They're just change management, getting people to try to avoid the things we talked about, repeat scanning, multiple like reconstructions from priors, et cetera. And some of those easy solutions, they they um, they might not be the biggest bang, uh, but they might cost you something when you go to buy your new scanner. So yeah, with that, um, thank you all for your attention. And uh, yeah, we can do some questions. Um, I, I thought the presentation is fantastic. And I, I have a, a few part question, um, mostly for you, but if Tony wants to join it as well. The first part is when you've gone into those hospitals and shown them that they could lower their dose pretty easily without you know impacting anything about their diagnosis what, what is their response when you when you've done that like how do they is it is it something that's just sort of a minor thing that no one notices or is the department super excited about it and wants to do more of it themselves in in the biggest trial we had at auction it was auctioner um people there they want to do good for their patients they they just you know they want to stay out of tr trouble from the bosses that be um it's just they they need help right like you know even they're a big a big hospital system they need someone to help them uh know what to do in the most optimized way um so like when we came in they're like yeah this totally makes sense and now that we gave them exactly clear instructions that were blessed by in the admin and the radiologists they implement that you know, that 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 was a, a really awesome win for us there. So, I mean, I I, I was hoping that would be the answer. And I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I have only had that experience with working with hospitals, that they were appreciative that we helped them figure out simple ways to improve what they were doing. My next question is sort of ties into several that are in the Q&A. You know, do you have a publication identifying these guidelines for technologists? They're so helpful. Do you have a list of protocols that, you know, we could that identify the protocols and how many phases they should be? And, and sort of the question I would add to that is how how can we go from here to there, a slide I had yesterday, to have everyone implement the things that you are suggesting? Like what what as opposed to everyone having to sort of go through their protocols individually, is there any way that we can make all of these approaches just easier to easier to do what would it take to get there i mean this is your, you know that you don't need to have a solution but what, how do you think we could do it yeah we need so at so that's like in academia that would be like asking you know one institution to be like hey this you'd have to be like some people would view it as these guys are telling us what to do and they think they know how to do it better. So you've, we've got to get over that mentality and say, hey, we've got to recognize that it's better for our patients who especially might be ping ponging between our two healthcare centers. If we're doing the same thing, that that's going to be better for the patient. So I think that there's a, we have a really strong way to win that argument, but that is going to be the, the hurdle there. And then I think the second one is just disseminating uh, know-how is really really hard that's probably why there's a lot of like translational research centers around and like the nih funds those so much as you know it's not easy to be like hey this is a good way to do this and then have that penetrate from academia through like local like city hospitals to rural centers i think we still need a lot more like tools and uh people time people power to like make that happen uh, changing practice is hard yeah, I mean, if you go to our website now, like at UWM at Wisconsin, like all of what I consider like our practice culture, like every almost everything, like there's protocoling guides, like what the protocols have to be, how to mix the contrast, all that stuff is like is up there. Like that's that is like our goal with partnering with one of the OEMs, the vendors, is to like help their customers get there by just saying like, look, we don't have. I just hired my third CT tech to do this stuff and not scan a patient and not get any revenue. Uh, to the hospital but that is crazy right like who can afford that many people to do this right we're fortunate we could do that and like our goal is you know to disseminate that but it's um not we we totally understand like most people don't even have a lead tech that does protocoling at all they like the apps person comes you buy the new scanner and they're like 
set it up overnight. I hope tomorrow morning I could scan and no one complains. But uh, anyway, I digress. Yeah, th th those are the two challenges. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think as a profession, uh, we need to figure it out. And I want to make just one plug for in our collaboratory of 166 hospitals, one of the hospitals that performed the best was a private hospital in Texas where a single technologist lead said, I really care about this. I'm going to take this on and just did amazing work to standardize. And so sometimes the best practices are coming from our academic sites and sometimes they're coming from really committed um, physicians, yep. technologists, medical physicists out in the community. Um, and I, I just feel like we need to come up with a solution that makes it easier to do the right thing and having us all create our own protocols just seems like we're making it harder for everyone. Yeah. And that was a great, really, really, the last two talks were terrific. And Tony's talk in the middle was terrific. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Rebecca. And it's been a yeah, fun conference. Uh, I'll see you guys later tonight or later this afternoon, I guess. Yeah.